a few months ago, I dropped a major cliffhanger. Secretly, 453 is possible, but that's a topic for another day. Today, I'll finally share the secret with you. And unless you already know what's coming, it's probably not what you think. The answer is very unintuitive. See, in order to go faster in Super Mario Bros., we need to go slower. For as well known as this game is, today we'll be exploring some territory that's likely foreign to a lot of you watching. It's time to break down how 453 is possible on the PAL version, and how the fastest version of Super Mario Bros. is actually the slowest version of Super Mario Bros. Real quick, did you guys know that with Netflix now you can do more than just watch things, you can also play things? This video is sponsored by Netflix Games. Right now, included with your Netflix membership, you have access to over 80 mobile games. You've got games like Sonic Prime Dash on there. There's some good stuff. Let's go over how it works. On the home screen in the app, you swipe down to find the mobile games row, and from there you just scroll through until you find what you want to play. Tap on the game you want, tap get game, it's that easy. There's a whole bunch to choose from, and here are some pretty cool examples. Some of my personal picks would be Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon and definitely Bloons Tower Defense 6. But yeah, you can play all these games right from the Netflix app with no extra fees, and best of all, no ads. If you're interested, click the link in the description and go check out Netflix Games. And thanks to Netflix Games for sponsoring today's video. All right, let's talk about the fastest version of Super Mario Bros, a version you may be entirely unfamiliar with. We're talking about the PAL version. PAL, P-A-L, stands for Phase Alternating Line. It, ahem, <clears throat> was one of three major analog color television standards, the others being NTSC and CCAM. Look, this is a video about speedrunning Mario, not electrical engineering. So I'll keep it brief, because the longer I talk about this, the more likely I am to make mistakes and get flamed in the comments. But the context here is really important, so we're gonna try. Basically, the part that's relevant to this video is that different countries have different standards for how their TVs and their electrical outlets work. Nowadays our TVs use digital signals instead of analog, so this is less relevant. But back in the day, it was pretty important to design things around the frequency, or hertz, of the electric currents coming out of your power outlets. In Japan, you know, the country where Nintendo games are made, they use the NTSC standard which means electric currents alternate in and out of their home at 60 hertz, or 60 times every second. Games and TV signals were designed around this, so the typical NES game runs at 60 frames per second. That means we redraw the whole screen 60 times every second to give the appearance of motion and put the video in video game. Most of the Americas also use NTSC, so the majority of my audience, you played the NTSC version of Nintendo games in all their 60 FPS glory. You played them as they were designed, and as they were intended. Now, let's talk about PAL. In Europe, Australia, most of the world really besides America and Japan, they're working off 50 hertz. Since the early 2000s, that hasn't posed so much of a problem in the video game realm. But before then, oh boy. 50 hertz means retro games were running at 5 sixths the speed compared to their NTSC counterparts. If a game was originally 60 frames per second, that means now it would run at 50 FPS. But sometimes games were 30 FPS, so that meant 25 FPS. And then there's Ocarina of Time, being drawn on the screen at a blistering 17 frames per second. So yeah, to sum things up, the majority of video games were made in regions that used 60Hz and designed with that in mind. When the games were sent over to countries that used 50Hz, they had to be adjusted. There were a few different approaches taken when adjusting games to run at 50 frames per second, and there were definitely some mixed results. One approach is to just do nothing. Let the game run at 5 6 speed, and call it a day. This is how that turns out. Yeah, not a very pretty outcome. Some games got a little bit better treatment. It started being fairly common to at least adjust the music and sound effects. 
even if the gameplay wasn't totally optimized for 50 FPS, it wasn't painstakingly obvious that anything was out of order. I'd say Mario Kart 64 is a good example. The game looks and plays pretty good. Unless you also saw or played the NTSC version, you probably wouldn't even realize that your carts are driving a little bit slow. A decent number of games got this sort of okay treatment, but every now and then, a game would be optimized exceptionally well for PAL. The best example I'm familiar with is Super Metroid. Unless you're really familiar with the game, you probably wouldn't even know the difference just by watching footage. Now let's pause and think about just how many things there are to change to account for just the change in frame rate. You of course have to adjust all the sounds and music so that they sound normal. There's also some obvious physics changes, like making the player move a little bit faster so they don't look sluggish. But you have to be careful. Doing this could probably introduce some new bugs, right? <laughs> We'll get there. But focusing back on adjusting the player speed, that's not as easy as it sounds on paper. You've got horizontal speed and vertical speed. You've also got acceleration. That's gonna affect all your jump heights, your attacks, a million things. And that's just the player character. How about the enemies, the environments, the animations of all these things? It's a Herculean task. And even if you put in the effort to tweak every little detail, it's probably still not going to be perfect. More often than not, it'll be impossible to directly translate the original data values. You can't just multiply everything by 1.2. Decimals can be tricky business. Even modern computers can't deal with decimals perfectly all the time, but a lot of older hardware didn't have any capacity for decimals. Developers got pretty creative, but nothing was ever perfect. And yes, this did sometimes lead to new unintended behavior. Like in Super Metroid, because of the difference in Samus' speed, or the speed that the door closes, or both, I'm not really sure, you can just barely jump out of this room before the door closes and skip a boss fight. Alright, all of that being said, are you ready to talk about Super Mario Bros? It's been a bit, but I hope you're still with me. Let's talk about the PAL version of SMB1. This game got alright treatment when it came to converting to 50 FPS. Some stuff slipped through and wasn't really changed like the speed that platforms move, or how long Bowser takes to fall in the lava. And stuff like the power-up sound is pretty nasty if you're used to the NTSC version. These things aren't too bad for the most part though, and despite all that, they did manually adjust quite a few things. The speed that firebars rotate, the speed that enemies move, the music is adjusted and it's fine, I guess. The PAL version also came out a couple years later, so they went ahead and patched some bugs. And they even adjusted some things like how bloopers swim, so you can't just stand around on the bottom and be safe from them. But alright, let's talk about the things that we'd be interested in for a speedrun. Things like the length of a frame rule? The original frame rule is a 21 frame cycle that dictates a lot of things in the game. The PAL version runs at 5.6 speed, so they adjusted the length. The infamous 21 frame rule is now the 18 frame rule. An 18 frame cycle at 50 FPS is pretty close to a 21 frame cycle at 60 FPS, but not exactly the same. The optimal cycle for speedrunning every stage is going to be different due to this. But it's going to be different for a lot more reasons than just that. They of course also had to adjust Mario's speed. Mario's top speed could actually be perfectly changed from 40 to 48. So accounting for the difference in frame rate, Mario runs through levels at the exact same speed in both versions. But remember, top speed isn't all there is. Mario's acceleration is actually faster on PAL. Sort of crazy fast. You can really see it in this room in 8.4. And once again, horizontal speed isn't all there is. We have to think about vertical speed as well. Mario can actually jump higher in this version. The easiest way to see that is with this row of bricks up high in the very first level. On the NTSC version, you can't quite reach them, but on PAL, you can. Surprisingly, having higher jumps doesn't really save time anywhere. There aren't really any obstacles we couldn't already clear. But it's actually not Mario's speed on the way up that we're interested in. Let's talk about his speed on the way down. A couple years ago, Happy Lee released a video about an impossible floor clip. The basic premise is that in order to clip through the floor in this game, you would need to travel more than 5 pixels in a frame. This game checks for Mario to land anywhere in the top 5 pixels of the ground, and when he does, it snaps his position to the top pixel. If you could manage to go more than 5 pixels deep, you'd bypass the floor check and enter the ground. 
Usually you don't get this much speed, because as you fall and start to get close to 5 speed, the game says, uh-uh, you can't go that fast, and it caps your speed down to 4. But sometimes you can get up to 5 speed, for one single frame before it applies the speed cap and puts your speed back to 4. Here's a technical explanation by DesmileCat you can pause to read if you want to understand the nitty gritty. The problem is that it's never normally possible to be right next to the ground at the moment you do briefly hit 5 speed. You're always too far away to take advantage of the temporary higher speed. In this video, Happily showed that you could get the right positioning by doing a separate glitch to spawn a vine at the start of 1-2. Climbing on it lets you fine tune your position and allows for the necessary conditions for the floor clip. A very niche situation, but a thing you can do. Alright, all of that was about the NTSC version of the game. Now let's talk about PAL. On PAL, Mario's downward speed cap is 5 instead of 4. But the floor check is now the first 6 pixels of the floor, so we need to get more than 6 speed to get through. As it turns out, with the right conditions you can reach not just 6 speed, but even up to 7 speed before the game applies the speed cap and puts you back down at 5. That's sounding promising. It can't be done just anywhere, but it can be done in some places, and that's good enough for us. One way to get the 7 downward speed is jumping at a very specific height and then landing on enemies. We can do that here at the end of 1-1 and clip into the ground. Those who are familiar with the flagpole glitch in this game know that it happens by grabbing the flag lower than normal. And if you can grab it especially low, you'll get what we call the full flagpole glitch, where Mario falls out of the left side of the block and you instantly trigger the timer countdown. This is most commonly seen by bouncing on a bullet bill next to the flag, since bullet bills give you a really low bounce and it lets you grab the flag very low. Another good way to grab the flag really low is by being very low ourselves, down in the ground. You can jump out of the ground and into the flag, triggering a full flag full glitch. The SMB1 warpless task gets in the ground in various ways throughout the run, and manages to pull this trick off several times. But now that we're talking about the PAL version, we have a PAL exclusive way to get in the ground. Once you bounce off these Goombas and get in the ground at the end of 1-1, you can run over to the flag and get a full flagpole glitch. Since this skips not only the flag coming down, but also the need for Mario to walk to the castle, it saves a lot of time. Doing it this way in 1-1 can save around 1.4 seconds. Actually huge. There aren't any other places we can clip near a flagpole in the run, but there is one other candidate for the floor clip to save time, in 1-2 to reach the warp zone. The falling platform lets us start a jump from all sorts of different heights, and that makes it possible to reach 7 speed right next to the ground and clip in. This trick, combined with PAL's very fast acceleration, means we can do some tight movement to load the warp zone and save 0.72 warping to world 4. One final perk of PAL physics is in 4-2. On NTSC, this is about the hardest stage in the run. It takes something like 17 frame-perfect inputs to match the task in 4-2 on NTSC, but on PAL, you can kind of just jump backwards into a couple walls. You get pushed forwards plenty of pixels for the wrong warp to work, you can do some simple warp zone movement with PAL's really fast acceleration, and yeah, it ends up being possibly the easiest stage to match the task, instead of the hardest. The same is also true of 8-4. No need for constant, double-fast acceleration jumps everywhere. The stairs at the beginning are a little tricky, but after that you can mostly just hold right or left to accelerate where you need to, and only lose a very small handful of frames throughout the stage. There is a trick in the third room where you land without holding the run button, so you can turn around and get in the wrong warp pipe faster. But that's a tiny optimization. In general, getting a clean 8.4 is pretty straightforward. Alright, we've gone over a few places where PAL has version-exclusive glitches that let us go faster than NTSC and the stages that are usually the hardest are now the easiest. This should definitely make 453 possible. The current world record does the floor clip in 1-1. He doesn't do the 1-1-2, in and his 8-4 wasn't quite as good as he'd hoped. Moment of truth, if we were to add all of these things into his run, what kind of a time would we get? 503? <laughs> what gives? That is so far off. We're supposed to be talking about 453. All right, before you write your angry comment, let's keep going. Even though Mario can run through the stages at the same top speed as NTSC and accelerate faster, and do brand new glitches to save time, the timer takes longer to count down. The timer ticks down once every frame to award you points at the end of levels, and since PAL is only 50 frames per second instead of 60, that's sadly just gonna take longer every time it happens. 
we lose about a second on average each time. Well, if we're losing five seconds to the timer counting down throughout the run, how are we possibly going to get a 453 on this version? Here we go, friends. One more version exclusive trick on the PAL version. The most powerful of them all. In my video about how 453 is almost possible on NTSC, I explained that it's just barely not possible to grab the flag low enough for a full flagpole glitch, without special conditions like an enemy or clipping in the floor. Even with the best known approach and input combination, Mario is a fraction of a pixel too far away. But here we are on the PAL version, with slightly different physics, and what do you know? It is possible. Wait, if we can do this, why are we bothering clipping in the floor in 1-1? Why isn't the world record doing this in runs, on all of the flagpoles? Well, here are the inputs you need to pull this trick off. On top of getting the perfect positioning with your jump to the flagpole, you need to switch between left and right on the D-pad every frame. The D-pad has to be on left, and then all the way down on right the next frame, then all the way down on left the next frame, and then all the way to the right again. All frame perfectly with a frame perfect jump in the middle. Here's what that input sequence looks like in real time. These are some fast and physically difficult inputs. It is possible to do inputs like these by utilizing some interesting controller grips, but it's really hard to do them reliably. Runners typically tackle them by holding the controller sideways and using their left hand for A, B, and right on the D-pad. They then use two fingers on the opposite hand to double flick left on the D-pad. On the surface, this might just look like what Tetris players do, where they roll on the controller to get really fast inputs. And they do that constantly, so this can't be that hard. But it's more than that. This has more moving parts, and it's more precise. You need the perfect amount of pressure on both sides of the D-pad, so you properly get left, right, left, right. It's really easy for one of the inputs to not go through, and just one frame of neutral anywhere in the sequence will ruin everything. All of this may start to sound a little familiar if you've heard about the legendary final frame that was saved in 8.4 on NTSC. An ultra hard input sequence is required to do the beginning of the level at perfect speed. The full flagpole glitch inputs are very similar to that, and runners have pulled that off. But let's take a step back and remember that this spot is infamously hard. This is the hardest time save in the entire run on that version. It was the very last hurdle runners had to overcome to prove that a perfect run was even theoretically possible. Now here we are on the PAL version, where we need this type of thing once again. But it doesn't save one frame in this version, it saves 2.8 seconds on every flagpole. They didn't adjust the length of the flag animation on the PAL version, so it's 20% slower than NTSC, and skipping it entirely saves a lot of time. But doing so is so hard. 453 is possible, but is it really viable to do this hard of a trick five times in one run? Runners have shown that it's possible in general. The first person to prove it was 3 Creepio, showing that it could theoretically be done. Later, one other runner in particular took this concept and started tearing the game up with it. To no one's surprise, it's Nifsky. About a year and a half ago, he set out to try and match the tasks on each stage individually. Here he is hitting the trick for the first time in a full run of 1-1. One, one. Yes! Yes! No way! A little while later, he also managed to get it in a full run through of 4-1, as well as in 8-3. Nailing these three brought the human sum of best down to 456.5. Getting close, but wow, still a ways off. When each one of them saves so much time, it's kind of unfortunate in a way. Personally, I think we're actually really lucky that this trick isn't possible on NTSC. It makes the run a lot more interesting when you save a small amount of time in a bunch of different places, rather than things being over-centralized on one big trick. I think this trick would really ruin warpless categories as well, since you just want to focus on doing full flagpole glitches, instead of optimizing Bowser kills and other interesting things like that. Anyway, Nifsky kind of hit a roadblock after he got those first three levels done. The two remaining stages with flagpoles are a bit harder and more complicated. 8-1 has some frame-perfect pipe jumps and is a hard level in general. You don't have time to switch grips at the end of the stage, so you have to play the entire thing in this awkward way and it makes it hard just to get to the flagpole, let alone do the full flagpole glitch. And then there's 8-2, which has a couple obstacles blocking your path. 
The spiny egg that Lakitu throws at the start is right in your way on the PAL version. You have to slow down a little bit to get past it. It's also not possible to get past this pipe without slowing down, so that makes it tricky to have consistent movement and be precisely lined up for the flagpole glitch at the end. These trials were too much for Nisky to overcome, and it turns out that 453 is completely impossible forever. Just kidding. Last week, Nifsky learned I was working on this video and decided to go finish the job. He spent one day getting 8-1, and then another day getting 8-2. And just for good measure, he took one more day to do some attempts at 8-4, and managed to tie the task there to the frame as well. Granted, that is easier on this version than on NTSC, but still, very impressive. And all of that makes a perfect run of this version theoretically possible. So, what is the perfect time with all of these tricks anyway? Sorry to say it guys, but I've actually clickbaited you. 453 isn't possible. 452 is possible. 452.2. If you do a perfect run of this game, that's the time you'll get. Five full flagpole glitches. Floor clip in 1-2. Tight movement in 4-2. And a perfect 8-4. That does leave about four frame rules of wiggle room if we just want to get a 453 and officially make this the fastest version of the game for speedrunners. And it just so happens that if you do the floor clip in 1-1 for the easier flagpole glitch, and your movement is perfect throughout the stage, you can just barely squeeze out a frame rule. And that lets you clock in just four frame rules behind the regular full flagpole glitch. I think that could be a good approach to 453. But don't listen to me, I haven't ran this version. Let's hear things from the current world record holder, Miniland who, fittingly, is from the UK, a PAL region. Let's hear what his thoughts are about the future of PAL. What do I think the future of PAL? Well, it's highly dependent on if people actually care to run the game. So make a great video and make people want to play the game, please, please. I really want to see more people play PAL. I think 503 without full FPGs is very, very doable. Once it hits 503, if someone's interested enough, and gets good at full FPGs, which should happen, people can get sub-5. Honestly, the main reason the record on PAL isn't lower is mostly just because very few people have put time into it. The NTSC version is a lot more widely popular and already has a storied history. But I wonder where we'd be if the NTSC version never existed. What if the original was just like this from the get-go? Here's the thing. If NTSC didn't exist, we would never have had Andrew G sub-5 and all that. Say we live in a world where NTSC didn't exist and world record right now was 505 PAL. There would be people looking at PAL, looking at the game and going, do you know, we just have to do full FPGs and we get sub five. The first ever time someone had ever beaten Mario 1 in under five minutes. And then they would go for it in a heartbeat. Say five people went for sub five. The first person gets sub five. The others aren't just gonna quit. It's like 454, people keep going and trying to improve it. So I could see, Someone going, oh, you've got sub-5, I'm going to do more flagpole glitches. We'd be so much better at full FPGs than we are now, because we have reason to get good at them. I think there's always going to be someone crazy enough to go, record is this, I'll just one-up it, I'll do one more. So there you go, guys. It could happen someday, but it's way harder to do than the current world record on the NTSC version is. And the flagpole inputs aren't just hard, they also... hurt. Doing this literally gives you blisters. Physically scraping your finger across the d-pad like that. You ever see people do 8 4 AL and they're wearing tape on their fingers? That's not for like friction or anything. That's so they don't get injured. Or rather so they get injured less. But even with all these factors, if people get enough interest, it may one day happen. After all, people are always asking what runners are going to do after they finally get a perfect run. So maybe grinding the PAL version is the next step. Sub-5 itself is going to be a huge milestone for the PAL version someday, and maybe the thought of going even faster than NTSC can will motivate someone down the road to try. Let's even say 454.29 happens or something, and people are like, we don't yeah. want to play anymore. It's possible to get under NTSC on PAL, right? That's what 453 means. Mm -hmm. That would be the fastest completion of the game. Would that be an incentive to get 453? Yes, but I would- Okay, but okay. Having... Spoiling my next video. <laughs> That's right, this isn't the end of the road. Sorry to do this to you guys again, but there is yet another approach we can take to try and beat Super Mario Brothers faster than ever. But once again, that's a story for another day. Thanks for watching. Hey, we are really close to 200,000 subscribers. 
I'm going to keep making videos like these, so consider subscribing if you enjoy it. It helps.